Tonight on Healthy, Wealthy and Wise, we meet the wheelers who have journeyed to the four corners of the world, writing their famous travel guides. Tonight, we discover their favourite holiday spot in Australia. Lynn Talbot joins Melinda Clark, who took to the skies when she produced a very unusual map, illustrated with thousands of characters and buildings. And the fire brigade shows Jim Brown the hidden dangers around your home and how by taking some simple measures, you could save your family in an emergency. Hello everyone, welcome to the show and Gondwana Rainforest Sanctuary, which recreates a rainforest right in the heart of the city, complete with birds, reptiles, marsupials and great waterfalls. It's all part of Brisbane's latest family experience, South Bank Parklands on the old Expo site. Now, also on tonight's show, Ian Hewitson cooks up an old classic Irish stew. It should be delicious. And Ronnie Burns looks at what to consider when designing your new kitchen. Now, this is Fire Awareness Week, and Jim Brown has some important advice that could save the lives of your family. Well, this is what everyone dreads, your home going up in smoke. Well, this is National Fire Awareness Week, and tonight on Healthy, Wealthy and Wise, we present what fire brigades all over the country say is the best advice to save your home and save your life. For all emergencies, the key is preparation. And with home fires, you're never too young to learn. Lauren, you remember that you've forgotten your very best dolly. What are you um, going to do? I would leave it there because Mum could buy me another one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We can't buy another Lauren, can we? <laughs> but we can buy another dolly. Trevor and Kim Evans make sure their children know what to do if their home catches fire. Exercises like this are a fun way of getting serious, life-saving messages across. The Melbourne Metropolitan Fire Brigade's Fire Safety Officer, Commander Terry Hunter, believes every family should prepare for a home fire like this. Jim, I think what's happening here is excellent. Um, the Evans family have obviously purchased a smoke detector for their home and they've taken the important next step. They've practised an evacuation plan in case of fire and they've tested their kids' knowledge. And you've got to do it more than once, don't you? Oh, you have to practise this fire drill at least twice a year, I think, with kids. The smoke detector is undoubtedly the most important life-saving device in recent years. Every home should have one or more. These are all approved. You'll find these in most of the major hardware and variety stores throughout Australia. And we recommend that every home has at least a battery-operated smoke, de smoke detector installed. And they are reliable? Absolutely reliable, Jim. They've saved thousands of lives throughout the world. And the price range? The price range is from between 10 to 60 to 70 dollars depending on the type you buy. Despite all the warnings, smoking in bed and children with matches or cigarette lighters are still some of the biggest causes of home fires. Fire brigades say home safety requires a constant eye on all our electrical appliances. Turn off electric blankets, uh, turn off kettles, turn off toasters, turn off drying cabinets. Air conditioners? Washing machines? Air conditioners, washing machines. You should leave no electrical appliances operating when you leave the home. Now, electric blankets in wintertime, I know this time, the winter's now just about over and people will be looking to do something different with them. Here's one here, which I gather is not going to be used again. That's correct. Uh, could you tell us why? Uh, well, the owner of this electric blanket has decided that it's, uh, it's much safer not to use an electric blanket in the home. Uh, this electric blanket, if it's going to be used again, should be hung up in the wardrobe ready for use next winter. It should not be folded up because you have the problem of uh, damaging the internal elements. So it shouldn't, if you scrunch up an electric blanket like this, you're probably going to damage it and make it dangerous. Absolutely. And if you ever find an electric blanket like that, uh, if you don't throw it out, um, you should have it tested by electricity authority. Now, a fire like this takes place, it, it's, it's a fire which is feeding on oxygen. Yes, that's right. There is one prime rule that you must never do when you've got a fat fire on the stove. Absolutely. Never add water to a fat fire. And yet, 
when people think fire, they think water, Absolutely. and in this heat of the moment, they're going to go and put water on a, onto something like that, which is the worst thing. Well, the problem is it will only spread the fire and it won't put it out. So we uh, probably shouldn't be negative about this, but should we demonstrate what you shouldn't do? Well, we can demonstrate what you shouldn't do. Right then. So this is some water. I've gone to the tap. I've, I've panicked. Haven't thought the motor through, and I'll throw some water on the. Let's see what happens. Good. I can see now why that is the wrong thing to do. How you deal with it is you use a fire blanket to put it out. Just open it up, pull the flap down. Yep. Grab the tapes. Yep. Pull it all the way down and out. Yep. Right. And then it uh, holds. Unfolds. Yep. Now hold it up in front of your face. Yeah, you I can, can still see through it. I can see the fire through it. Now just move forward very slowly and lay it over the fire. Just, just like that. Exactly. Well, Terry, assuming now we have a fire extinguisher, which every house should have, I believe. Um, I've never used one before. How do I use a fire extinguisher? Well, you've done the first thing, right? You've pulled the pin. Yep. The second thing you need to do is aim it at the fire. Yep. Just hold it. The next thing you need to do, and I'll explain it first, the next two things are squeeze the trigger and sweep the extinguisher from side to side. So as you squeeze the trigger, just sweep it very gently from side to side. That's it, and the fire's out. If you don't have a $30 fire blanket or a fire extinguisher for under $100, here's an easy, safe way to deal with this particular blaze. And, uh, Very gently, just place the lid over the fire. Don't Keep panic, just do it slowly. That's right. Safety switches are another important home fire safety device, now compulsory in some states for all new homes. Now, some advertising shows a safety switch installed on the fuse box as the best way. But Home Safe's fire and security consultant Murray MacDonald says there is another way to use them. Most people seem to think, like I did, that one of these is all you need. I put this on my fuse box of my house, and my house is protected, and that's all I have to worry about. That's not right, is it? No, Jim. The areas that you're wanting to protect in the home are the power circuits. The power circuits are where electrocutions occur, are where appliances are faulty. So the power circuits is what you're trying to protect. So a safety switch like this protects the power circuit. You place it on the first power point on the home and it protects all other power points downstream. So you don't need to put them everywhere, just on the first power point of a circuit and the whole circuit's protected. That's right. Unfortunately, the wiring in some of our homes, especially the older ones, is faulty. And you won't find out until an electrician tries to install a safety switch. How would a member of the public, or an electrician for that matter, know whether the safety switch he's putting in really works? Well, Jim, at home safe, we make sure the installation is working correctly by testing it out afterwards. We have test equipment, as this meter is, that tests the speed that the safety switch will react in. And that speed needs to be 30 thousandths of a second. We've got a safety switch there, can we test that one? Certainly. This is a power point safety switch. We'll plug in our test equipment, turn on the power point and we'll induce 30 milliamps into the circuit and then it should trip. That's 18 thousandths of a second. That's right, 18 milliseconds it's now tripped at. So this safety switch is fine and this is a good installation. One central message was brought home to me time and again when I was covering the Ash Wednesday fires is that what really tears the heart out of people is not the loss of the home, not the loss of the chattels. It's the loss of the family heirlooms and memories. Photographs, jewellery, things that are destroyed in the flames. No insurance policy can replace these. Fire safes like this, costing between five to eight hundred dollars, are worth considering if you have important documents or precious photographs worth protecting. This week, if you have any questions about protecting your home, your local brigade's fire safety officer will give you good advice. A feature of this beach is the wreck of the Cherry Venture, rusting away after being grounded during a storm around 15 years ago. It's a popular stopping off spot on the way to Fraser Island, just a little further north.
take a different path. The new four-door V6 Pathfinder from Nissan. The new Nissan. Gold 104. I remember when Rock was young. Me and Susie had so much fun. There she was, just walking down the street singing. Time Oldies, Gold 104. I just can't resist. These big sister cakes are yummy. And they're fat free. 97% fat free and low cholesterol. Rich dark chocolate. Oh, delicious tangy orange. Smooth moist vanilla. <sighs> if these big sister cakes had been around when I was a little girl, I'd still be a little girl. Big Sisters 97% fat-free, low-cholesterol cakes. Mm. I don't know, it just feels so dry and brittle. Look at these split ends. Don't worry, it just needs a little TLC. Well, that's easy for you to say. No, it's easy for you too. This one's perfect. Sun Silk Moisture Plus. Yeah, Moisture Plus has an intense moisturising system to revitalise and protect dry hair right through to the ends. You see? Soft and shiny. Now you can do it yourself. Just uh, borrow the sunset then. Sunset girl. Tonight on Channel 10. We're going to find him and bring him back. Get ready for the ride of your life. Do it for 100,000. Robert De Niro, a tough bounty hunter. I know you all have two minutes and already I don't like you. Charles Grodin, a sensitive criminal. That's too bad, I really like you. From the director of Beverly Hills Cop, 8.30 tonight, midnight run on 10. can't decide where to have your holiday, well, you could go and buy a travel guide to help you. But what happens if you actually write those travel guides? What do you do then? Where do you go on holidays? Australia's most successful travel authors have chosen Noosa. Well, that, that, very, that very first night we were in Australia, we had a, an, an amazing... Tony and Maureen Wheeler have taken their children around the world writing the Lonely Planet series of travel guides. They could take their holidays as an adventure in any of the most remote places on Earth, but instead they're doing exactly the same as thousands of other families, a typical Australian holiday at the beach. And while they're in this part of southeast Queensland, the wheelers are taking advantage of some of Australia's most beautiful destinations by taking a four-wheel drive trip with a group of friends. So you haven't actually been across this way before. You can try no. as well to Fraser Island. This is just the beach way. This is the long way, the, the real way. I think if you, if you fly places, you haven't really been there. That's my, my theory of these things. And do you do that everywhere else in the world? I think if there's, a, if there's a, a tougher way of doing it, you really should do it the tough way, first of all. I, I, I've been up to Kathmandu once where, you know, you take the trains through India and you get there and you, you have to take this appalling place on the border and you take a, a day-long bus ride up to, the, up to Kathmandu and it's fantastic. And you do it once, and every other time after that, you fly. What would be well, the hardest ones you've done? Oh, God. I, I, Maureen and I did a trip through um, Indonesia about 20 years ago by motorcycle. <gasps> we rode from one end of Indonesia to the other by motorcycle. And we, 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 a couple of places to get between islands, we had to get the boat out, the motorcycle out to a boat and load it on. And in one place, we took this motorcycle on a dugout canoe. And we had this guy sitting on the, on the, on the motorcycle, sort of balancing the canoe. <laughs> and I, I could see the, you know, the motorcycle disappearing into... 20 metres of water, but um, we, we've never had anything appalling happen. No. So basically you believe if you just have courage and go forward, it'll work out? Keep going, yeah, that's the answer. This picturesque ferry ride over the Noosa River takes us away from resorts and subdivisions and heads for a coastline that's undeveloped and largely unspoiled. The 50 kilometres of uninterrupted beach north of Noosa makes a perfect driving surface at low tide. When the tide's in, the going's much slower on the soft sand close to the dunes, so if you plan on doing this, watch the tide times. This beach is actually a gazetted road and normal traffic rules apply here, the same as any bitumen highway. But when you stop at this roadside, you'll have a near deserted beach, cliffs of coloured sand, and the Pacific Ocean to swim in. These beaches are perfect spots to get away from the crowds, but be careful in the water, it's a long way from the nearest lifesaver. My two have a tendency to sort of start heading out for the nearest um, 
near a soil rig or something, but they, they're not going too far. Days like this for the wheelers are enjoyable, but only mildly adventurous after their experiences around the world. So why pick a holiday at Noosa? We were actually booked to go to India, and uh, we had a very heavy travel schedule last year. We were in Europe three or four times. We went to uh, Vietnam, to Bali, to Inamenka. It was a hard year. And at the end of the year, the children had a rebellion, just a mutiny. They said, look, we don't care where we go for the holidays, except we don't want to fly, we don't want injections, and we don't want malarial pills. So, so we thought... There is no malaria in Noosa. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't need injections and we could drive. And we also had some friends who were coming up here al already. So we just tacked on with them. There was also a feeling like we'd like to see what it was like to have a real holiday. <laughs> like everybody else. Like everybody else. I know this is what people do, but we've been doing what we do for something like 20 years. We have never, ever gone anywhere and stayed for more than just a few days. And in fact, the last few trips we made through Europe, we moved every day. And the longest we stayed anywhere was two places we stayed three nights. The Wheeler's Life of Travel is now based in Melbourne, where they publish a hundred guidebooks selling a million copies a year. The Lonely Planet Survival Kits are sold around the world, and there are more books in the process of being written. Now, how did it all start, the, the, the travel we, books? Originally, we, Maureen and I were living in London in the, the early 70s, and we just decided to take a year off and travel around the world. And, well, we, we still haven't got all the way around. We, we got as far as Australia. And we'd had a, just a, this amazing time crossing Asia, and, we met a lot of people doing similar things to us, and we were living in Sydney, and we, we kept meeting people who said, how do you do this, how do you do that? And we thought, why don't we write a book about it? And we did, and here we are. Well, what would you say was the single piece of good advice you could give somebody who's going on one of these holidays? Is there anything that's, just go. Absolutely, I think I you, mean, you, there's nothing you can say. Everyone finds their own way of traveling once they get started. But what most people seem to find the hardest thing to do is to just make that initial step into sort of launching off. And once you do that, everything else falls into place. That's the hardest thing, the decision to actually just take yourself off and go. A feature of this beach is the wreck of the Cherry Venture, rusting away after being grounded during a storm around 15 years ago. It's a popular stopping off spot on the way to Fraser Island, just a little further north. Fraser Island is more than a day trip from Noosa, so if you want to take in the sights of this delightful island, you'll have to plan ahead and make arrangements to camp or stay at one of the few resorts. And back at Noosa Heads, if you're thinking about trying a getaway to Noosa yourself, there's some basic information that will probably find its way into the guidebooks. Noosa is two hours drive north of Brisbane. There's regular coach services, and if you're flying, flights come into Maroochydore Airport, about half an hour's drive from Noosa itself. Accommodation ranges from caravan parks to campsites, not far from Noosa, to the Sheridan Hotel in Hastings Street. Accommodation here runs from $115 per person up to top-of-the-range celebrity suites. In between, there are motels, self-contained apartments, and holiday houses available through local real estate agents. And for some of the good reasons for coming to Noosa, a few tips from the travel experts themselves. It's relaxed and fairly slow moving and a lot of things to do. I, I, I think the restaurants are one thing. Just along this, this stretch of road, you've got more restaurants than you can believe possible. And they're good restaurants. Where do you swim? Do you go down the front here or do you go to the surf beaches? We've, we've done both. We've, been, we've taken the kids along the beaches in the National Park and we've also just hung out of the, um, the main beach. As well as the beach, Noosa is within half an hour's drive of dozens of interesting towns and villages just inland from the coast. One of them is Umundi, an historic little town where local business people and residents have taken the trouble to restore many of the old buildings on the main street. Now seldom does it rain out here. This is a lot busier than Umundi normally gets. It's a Saturday and the town is dominated by the weekly craft market. They really are lovely. I'll look at this one. As well as the usual offerings available at most craft markets, Yamundi also offers those traditional home crafts you find only in the country. Mm, I don't think I'll ever snore again. An additional attraction of the Yamundi markets are the very high quality and unusual handmade items being sold by some of the hundreds of craftsmen who've moved to this area from the cities. So how does Australia's most travelled couple rate one of Australia's most popular holiday spots? 
I think we have some of the best speeches, there's no question. These really are the, the best speeches you can find. And there's no one here. We're the only ones. Apart from the occasional <laughs> four-wheel drive rushing by you. People come to Australia, I mean, obviously they're interested in restaurants and accommodation, but really what they, the main attraction about this country is things like this. The fact you can be in, in a town like Noosa and half an hour later you're on a beach like this. putting me on to nappy sand. It's amazing. You know how dull that white blouse was? Well, you should see it now. It looks brilliant. I soaked Steve's shirt in nappy sand too, and the yellow's gone. It's really white again. And I was going to throw it away. Oh, and the kids' sports gear. That was in a real mess. But nappy sand got the stains out. No sweat. I couldn't believe it. Nappy sand brings them back to white. Fantastic. I don't know why you're drinking that stuff. Because it tastes good. I mean, you're not going to be impressing anyone for a long time, are you? <laughs> so, you're still drinking it then? I told you. Tastes good. Skinny milk has less than 1% fat Boy. and no cholesterol. Psst. So the calorie controlled diet... You're still drinking that stuff. You'll feel good on the inside and look even better on the outside. You can be an NBA star in the Sorbent All-Stars competition. 50 prize packs of Chicago Bulls or L.A. Lakers cap, t-shirt, jacket, socks, and basketball. And a grand prize of a 10-day trip for four to the NBA All-Stars tournament in Salt Lake City, flying Qantas, valued at $14,000. The Sorbent All-Stars competition. Details were sorted as sold. When you think about it, the kettle's probably the busiest thing in the kitchen, next to you and me. So when you buy a new one, you might as well buy the best. And that's the new Celsius kettle from Black & Decker. It's fully automatic. It boils a cup in around 30 seconds. And with this unique spout cover, it reboils faster. And that makes Celsius perfect for that second cup, third cup. The new Celsius kettle from Black & Decker suits me to a tea. The guilty are many, the innocent too few. They all had murder on their minds, but who pulled the trigger? A Mexican mystery in Murder, She Wrote, 8.30 Tuesday on 10. What is it about Oprah that brings out the best in people? We didn't have an Oprah Winfrey. We'd have to invent one. An all-star tribute to Oprah Winfrey, 8.30 Thursday on 10. Well, heads or tails, our Australian currency has certainly had a topsy-turvy sort of a time over the past few months. But for most of us, a dollar is still worth a dollar. Our Australian currency has had a chequered history since coins were first imported into the country in 1813, and since the Australian government issued its own legal tender for the first time in 1910. Legal tender is defined as any form of currency which can be used legally to repay a debt. But it's not always the case. For instance, one and two cent coins, which incidentally you can still use, can only be used up to the limit of 20 cents. Over that, people can legally refuse to accept it. If you've got five, 10, 20 or 50 cent coins, you can only use them to repay debts of up to $5. And if you've got one or two dollar coins, then you can only use them to repay debts of 10 times their face value. In other words, if you've got a two dollar coin, it can only be used to repay a debt of up to $20. Like the one and two cent coins, one and two dollar notes which were taken out of circulation in the 1980s can still be used as legal tender. One of the other things also is that if you've got a damaged note, say the corner's been taken off, you should take it to a bank because they might accept it, despite the fact that people generally do not have to accept it as legal tender. Speaking of which, there's been a great deal of controversy recently about the five dollar note and the fact that the ink potentially might be able to be rubbed off. Just remember that it's strictly illegal to tamper with any bank notes because they remain the property of the Reserve Bank of Australia. 
Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter how careful you are, accidents sometimes happen. You might put a few banknotes through the washing machine, or indeed your whole pay packet. Well, generally, in that case, a quick iron will bring it back like new. But there are examples right throughout Australia where people have been able to restore the value of their money when it's been partly destroyed. Some examples of that are where a group of workmen had their pay packets eaten by a goat. Some examples also where people have left money buried in jars in the backyard only to find it partially eaten and destroyed by worms or mildew. Now, in those cases, you should generally head for your bank or indeed to the Reserve Bank itself. The Reserve Bank has a mutilation note department where they'll try and re-establish the value of your notes. They're virtually a forensic department. But apart from that, I think I might have to go fishing myself and see what else I've left in the washing machine. Behind me is this wonderful, old-fashioned example of North Queensland architecture. And because of that, I thought I'd do this lovely old-fashioned dish, Huey's version of Irish stew. So let's just have a look. Very easy. What have we got here? We've got some potatoes, so we'll throw those in a pan. You can stay over there. Oh, you can follow me across. Some potatoes in there, just stay there for a second. Some carrots. We're doing a base, you know, that we can put some lamb chops on, right? Carrots there, also some onion. You can parboil these if you want them cooked a little bit more. I like them a bit crunchy, so I'm not worried about that. And I'm just going to saute those reasonably gently. And I've got some midloin lamb chops here, which I have just trimmed fairly well. See, I've taken all the fat and things. You take that off if you feel like it. And I've got on the grill there, I'll just put a bit of oil over on our grill, which is going at about 100 miles an hour. And I'm just going to seal these chops, all right? Just like that, pick out the nicest ones. We'll just do four or five. There, put those back over there. And a little bit of salt and pepper. Wait with the salt until they have sealed, because salt always pulls out the blood out of it, right? Keep your little base going here. Keep them sauteing. Obviously, separate your potatoes. You don't want them on top of each other. My mother used to make Irish stew, you know, in a pressure cook. It was terrific. Obviously, this is a... This is a real variation. Now, see how we're going there. See, they're just sealing. I don't want them cooked. I just want them to seal. Now, with that, I just pour off some of this oil, if I can do it without dropping everything. There we go. It's coming out. My goodness, I'm going to have a good day today, says he as he proceeds to then drop it everywhere. We'll just leave those over to the side. And then I'll put a little bit of this. This is just canned tomato that I've just chopped up. I'll just put a bit of that in there. Good squeeze of a bit of garlic. I like garlic, so I'd put a whole clove. You put as much or as little as you like, and a bit of parsley through there. Now, we'll just saute that a little bit more, just like that. And then I've got some... What I've got is some, a chicken stock cube here, or a beef stock cube, whichever you like, and I'm just going to pour some of that in there, just to give us something to put a base. We don't want it to catch when we cook them. Right, so we've made our base of vegetables there. As I said, keep them separate, just like that. And then we'll put our lamb chops on the top there. As I said, you can do as many or as few as you like. And I'm just going to cover that, and that's going to take about 10 minutes. And I thought, while we're doing that, let's trot around and have a look at some other North Queensland architecture. Northern Queensland's unique architecture had its origins in the gold mining days. Many of these elegant buildings date back to the 1880s, and the classic Queenslander was devised to combat the tropical sun. Later buildings followed the same style, and were often built on stilts and featured broad verandas, wooden shutters and window hoods, with intricate wooden fretwork and ornate wrought iron work. wonderful that there are so many great examples of Queensland architecture left, but we're here to cook, so let's have a look and see how I'm coming along. Ah, oh, that looks brilliant. Now that's taken about 10 minutes, now let's just get some of the vegetables out. You can see that the, my goodness, that was a wonderful noise. I think we've got a boat in the background somewhere. Just let's have a look and see what I can do here. This is the trickiest part, is actually getting the vegetables out without them breaking right up. So let's see how we go. But see, they're cooked nicely. The main thing is always to check the potatoes. They are the ones that'll take the longest time. Now, if you like well done lamb, obviously you cook it a bit longer. This will be about medium, I would say. Right, so we'll just do that. I'll throw those over there. Put my lamb chops on the top. 
See, four is a very large meal. You don't really actually need that. I'm making a right mess here. Just pour some of the juices here without getting in the way of the camera. Just like that. Let's try and neaten it up a little. And a good sprinkle of parsley. And that is Huey's Irish stew. Coming up next, we'll take you ballooning to map out one of Australia's beautiful cities. There's a new family wagon that loves parking almost as much as you used to. The new Serena from the new Nissan. If you prefer a capsule, here's something new. Panadol Gel Caps, a capsule-shaped tablet that's smaller, encapsulated in a gelatin coating, making it easier to swallow. Next time you want to relieve pain fast, the decision is which Panadol? Capsules or new gel caps? Take as directed and see your doctor if pain persists. Panadol, effective on pain, gentle on stomachs. How do you spell cream? Creamy. I see. P R A I S E. Praise natural mayonnaise. Rich and creamy as it can be. P R A I S E. It's made the old fashioned way, you see. P R A I S E. Praise natural mayonnaise. Nothing tastes. P R A I S E. Creamier. P R A I S E. I don't know, it just feels so dry and brittle. Look at this spruit in. Don't worry, it just needs a little TLC. Well, that's easy for you to say. No, it's easy for you too. This one's perfect. Sunsilk Moisture Plus. Yeah, Moisture Plus has an intense moisturising system to revitalise and protect dry hair right through to the ends. You see? Soft and shiny. Now you can do it yourself. I might just uh, borrow the Sunsilk then. Sunsilk Girl! Remember, one call to this number will take one more copy of this free South Australia holiday book out of circulation. Do it for Melbourne, Melbourne. Your next big day. It's a new street, E Street, 7.30 Wednesday and Thursday on Channel 10. She seduced three young lovers to kill her husband. I pulled the trigger. Now she's making new death threats from jail. Pamela Smart's the most famous female killer in America, but groupies even from Australia want her released. And the hired help spilling the beans on former screen idol Michael Landon. Hard copy, 9.30 Thursday. you can see one of the most spectacular views of Melbourne. You can see its parks and gardens, its bridges, the city buildings, the sporting grounds and even rowers on the Yarra. It's all here on the wall, on this map. A map that started as a dream and became an obsession for Melinda Clark. Well, it actually started back in 1986. I'd just arrived home from travelling. Um, you know, backpacking around Europe and America. And I picked up this great map of Los Angeles. And uh, when I got back to Melbourne, I thought, wouldn't it be great to have one of these of Melbourne? After investing thousands of hours of work and her life savings, Melinda's achievement is this character map of Melbourne, clothed in its buildings. From a windsurfer on St Kilda Beach to a cyclist beside the Yarra, it's all in print, describing in detail what life in Melbourne is all about. Not only is this map a piece of art, it's now an historical document. Not since this 1880 engraving by Samuel Calvert has a panoramic character map of Melbourne been produced. A lot of the buildings are still the same. We've got Customs House here, um, exhibition buildings. Actually... Five years ago, Melinda chose artist Deborah Young to help her fulfil her dream. Together they worked in a converted garage at the back of Melinda's mother's home. The biggest hurdle was we didn't know what we were doing. We just had to learn along the way. We were initially on a very, very limited budget, so it was just what we could get together. And we approached different tourist authorities and, and different people that, that gave us information. And it was, yeah, it was a culmination of, of just big borrowing and stealing sometimes. Ballooning 
morning offers the best bird's eye view of Melbourne, so Melinda soon became accustomed to 5am wake-up calls. And armed with camera and film, it was off to work on one of Chris Dewhurst's sunrise flights. I understand why you like the balloon so much now. Yeah. How many photos did you take? Uh, about 3,000 altogether from, from the balloon, yes. Whereabouts? Well, um, we where's took, the perimeters? Where's the perimeters? It's, it's, it's about a five kilometre perimeter around the actual central city. It was the best place to do the city shots. Um, and uh, we would get, I'd get different suburbs um, on different days depending where we were flying. The rest of it was done um, from the ground. We walked every street in Melbourne that we were going to be drawing on here and um, and just took thousands and thousands of photographs, 7,000 in, in total altogether with the aerials and, and the ground ones. It was Deborah who had the difficult task of translating the photographs into a drawing. It um, got easier as I went around the drawing. <laughs> I don't know how many thousands of buildings are on that drawing, but there, there must be quite a few hundred, uh, hundred thousand, I think. The building boom in Melbourne in the late 80s presented a further challenge. Deborah drew Melbourne Central on uh, way before it was even started and uh, from these photographs of their models and plans, this is 101 Collins Street, that wasn't started when we were first drawing that area. All of these are completed now but there are some buildings on here, uh, the ABC building, that's what it's going to look like but it's not built yet. We've got the new museum down in the South Bank area here. Um, so you're ahead of your time? We're way ahead of our time actually, up to about 1996. There was light at the end of the tunnel when 1,000 limited edition prints of this intricate black and white line drawing were produced. The proceeds enabled the production of a colour version. Well, the colour version was the culmination of another six to 12 months' work. We had to uh, re-research some of the areas. Um, we updated the drawing and then there was a couple of artists that hand coloured it. It was like putting a huge 7,000 piece jigsaw puzzle together. We had to refer back to every single photograph, find the building and then match the colour of that building to the drawing. So it wasn't a simple task. It was very, very long and drawn out. The 112 by 77 centimetre colour poster of the map sells for $39.95. The half size version for $25. But the popularity of the hand painted limited edition maps keeps the fine brushes of artists Mark Jackson and Heather Potter busy. So how many hours do you think you've spent on this one so far? <laughs> Have you counted yet? Funny experiences along the way now form the basis of a can you find quiz that accompanies the map. This particular fellow was uh, practicing golf right in front of a sign that said no golf practice. So we photographed him and he's on the map. Oh, where Deborah is he? Deborah drew him on right in the corner here. I shouldn't, tell you, I shouldn't actually tell you this because this is part of our grid reference and can you find list, but I will. <laughs> he's just over here. There's a big paddle steam boat. Anyone lucky enough to have one of these spectacular maps will have no doubt spent hours scouring for helicopters, didgeridoo players and tall ships attempting to complete the quiz. There's a tram. Some of them aren't easy and I don't apologise for that. Can and you let us in on the secret? No, Where is the frog? Absolutely Where is not. the frog? It's the most asked questions. I've had, I've had messages on my answering machine. Obviously people have been up till very late at night trying to find it so they've left a message on the answering machine. Please ring us and tell them where the frog is. Melbourne map postcards and greeting cards are already available. And don't be surprised to see the map on tea towels and jigsaw puzzles soon. But with the bubbling enthusiasm of a budding entrepreneur, Melinda is preparing to tackle a new project. It's definitely going to lead on to other cities and, and in fact, Sydney's down the track. It'll be, it'll be a lot quicker to do the, the next one because I, I, know the, I know what I'm up against. It's not hard to overcapitalise when you're planning a kitchen. And let's face it, most of us want what we see in the decorating magazines. But you do have to be realistic about what you need and what you can afford. There's a new family wagon that loves parking almost as much as you used to. The new Serena from the new Nissan. I drink milk because it's rich in protein and has the vitamins and minerals I need. 
that what I don't need is too many kilojoules. Of course, being too skinny can be as bad for you as being too fat and can even lead to serious menstrual problems. It's also important when you for two. During pregnancy, a woman needs almost twice the calcium. She needs it. And I need it. Because at menopause, a woman's bones begin to deteriorate at the rate of 1% a year, and the risk of osteoporosis is a very real one. So it pays to be careful. At my age, I have to look after myself. If you don't balance your diet and keep up your calcium, you're asking for trouble. Milk. You never stop needing it. Making Black & Decker commercials is pretty hard yakka. And the boys just can't do without Black & Decker's super dust buster. Cordless and rechargeable. It's perfect for life's little accidents. Black & Decker suits me to a T. Right now, there are a lot of new carpets pretending to be as good as Stain Master. That's why Pro Heart would just like to remind you why Stain Master carpet is still the best. Okay, custard. DuPont Stain Master, the original and still the best. Beautiful. Tomorrow night on Hinch, his disabilities have never stood in the way of his ambitions. I think you're putting a wider reverb on that sax. The man behind the magical sound effects in the Australian animated movie Fern Gully. Uh, one of my ambitions is to get a uh, license to ride a bike. Hinch weeknights at 7 o'clock on Channel 10. some stage in our life we've probably all had a kitchen that we'd love to change, add some more bench and storage space and perhaps replace an old timer like this stove here which has seen better days. Now when we're planning a new kitchen it's the one room in the house where it's very easy to overspend and tonight we're going to show you how to plan a new kitchen that suits individual needs and saves money. Laura Cook is coordinator of the Design Centre which is part of the Gas and Fuel Corporation in Victoria. It's the only centre of its kind in Australia which runs talks for the public on kitchen planning as well as offering a free kitchen design service by appointment or correspondence. There's basically two principles that we go by. One is to try and incorporate the workflow and that's all the appliances and bench space follow the sequence of tasks that you do around the kitchen. And the second principle that we give a lot of uh, room to is safety. We try and keep the traffic path of the cook and the secondary user separate by separating the kitchen into two areas. Laura, what are some of the mistakes that people make when they're putting in a new kitchen? Well, I think there's really only one mistake that people make and that's just not putting enough planning in before they actually do the kitchen and that results in the appliance being in the wrong place and just not enough bench space. Most kitchens fall into four basic shapes. There's the U-shaped kitchen, the L-shaped island, the island is a freestanding bench you can walk right around, the galley kitchen with doors at both ends, and the one wall kitchen. All of these kitchens can be divided into active and passive areas, and a safe kitchen means these areas don't overlap. What we're trying to avoid is probably the most dangerous accident that will occur in the kitchen, which will be something boiling over on the cooktop and you'll be wanting to get it straight to the sink. And by having the sink in the same line with the cooker, yep. you'll find you'll just be easily going along here with no collision with the traffic path. By placing the sink over here, when you make this movement, you won't be stopping to look for the dog or the two-year-old on the floor. There's a collision and the contents go on to you or to the child. Yes. So that's the accident that we're trying to avoid. It's not hard to overcapitalise when you're planning a kitchen. And let's face it, most of us want what we see in the decorating magazines. But you do have to be realistic about what you need and what you can afford. You have to keep in mind that the kitchen is a functional area. Mm -hmm. And so you need a hard-wearing, hard-working surface, not so much a good-looking surface. I think the biggest mistakes are in the selection of the materials. They choose inappropriate materials or more importantly, materials that they just can't afford for the kitchen. And the other area is in their selection of appliances. Standard bench height is 900 millimetres, and all the appliance manufacturers go by this height. 
the distance between the bench top and overhead storage should be no less than 450 millimetres and 600 millimetres for the range hood. You also have to allow 4.2 metres of wall space for the tall storage. That's fridge, cooktop and microwave. And 3 metres for low bench space which includes dishwasher and preparation bench. So you've almost got to put as much work into your overhead storage as your kitchen plan and once again you have to work out what it is you want to store and how it is you want to access it and then you can use all the options which is open shelving, uh, glass doors and the staggered heights and you should actually get quite a nice composition. Every kitchen plan will be a compromise and in fact the key to a good plan will be knowing exactly where to make those compromises. It's a dramatic transformation and it's won the 1992 Victoria Homes Kitchen of the Year in the under $5,000 category. That's $5,000 for the cabinet work. Appliances, flooring, tiling, painting and additional carpentry came to another $3,000. And it's these additions which a lot of people forget to include in their budget. I think the main feature about this kitchen is that uh, all the storage needs have been met. So obviously a good list has been made of what's got to be stored in this kitchen and then every available space has been made use of. Mm -hmm. Lynn Harrop designed her own kitchen where she can prepare meals in the active area while her kids can safely get snacks, go to the fridge or sink and not cross into this active zone. It cost $10,000 and Lynn's delighted with the results. One thing, I've always sort of gone for the sink under the window but why have you put it out here and in the bench? Well, in our house, um, the children play in the street. It's a cul-de-sac, so I wanted a good vision to the street, and also they play out in the courtyard. So while I'm working, I can see them, whatever they're doing, generally yes. speaking, unless they go to my range. But it's just for that reason. And uh, it also gives me a good access to the table, which yeah. is really oh, useful. Oh, the whole thing's completely open. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really a large kitchen, but it's well planned. No. The other thing I decided to try was keeping the crockery in a drawer. Um, it's a really sensible way to store crockery with the plates here. I can just lift off how many plates I want. And it's, it's in a drawer and the children can help me set the table. This bench works really well for you, doesn't it? It does, yes. It gives me a lovely big amount of space to work on. I can have the cakes cooking cooling here. Yeah. And I can be preparing dinner here. And if someone drops in, I can just make them a quick drink. One of the benefits of a well-planned kitchen is that it actually reduces the amount of time that you have to spend there. Can you agree, Lynn? I would agree very much. Time for a cup. Oh, well earned. Enter the man. It won't always be this bad. About to change her life. I just realised I don't know anything about him. Introducing Lockie Daddo to Neighbours, tomorrow on 10. Hello. Sorry to interrupt, but look, I think you'll want to take this number down. In a shocking statement issued today, it has been suggested that there is, in fact, life after Melbourne. This life is believed to exist in Adelaide. This came to light today as huge quantities of South Australia's Out of the Ordinary Holiday Book were seized here, featuring explicit scenes of people having fun. It has, of course, been suggested that the photographs were taken elsewhere. And certainly, controversial scenes of rotundas are known to be fakes. Tourism South Australia have gone to extreme lengths, circulating 86 glossy pages unashamedly free of charge. Rumour has it it's likely to be banned. So my suggestion is that you ring this number now. Remember, one copy in your hands is one less copy out there. Bought my glasses at Vision Express because one is not enough. Got my glasses at Vision Express because one is not enough. Vision Express understands you have an active life. One pair of glasses is not enough. So right now, Vision Express will give you two pair of glasses for the price of one. That's right, two for one. Vision Express, Knox District Centre, Burke Street City, Meyer City Store. Now also at Melbourne Central, Southland, Fountain Gate and Shannon Mall, Frankston. Hi, I'm Big and I know everyone in town. I'm easy to read, so you'll find it easy. Every time. No matter what you want, you can get it in the Big. Remember, 
One call to this number will take one more copy of this free South Australia holiday book out of circulation. Do it for Melbourne, Melbourne. Headaches affect us all at times and they're not much fun, but migraines are even worse. Naturopath Sharita Haas can offer some soothing advice though. Now what actually is the difference between a headache and a migraine? Well there's a great difference particularly to a migraine sufferer Lynn. When they have a migraine they really know they've got it. First of all they can feel violently ill, semi-paralysis, vision loss, uh, joints are affected, vomiting and nausea, so the list goes on. Each one responds differently, but they're a very debil debilitating illness. What can you actually do to prevent a migraine coming on? I mean, do you get warning signals? Well, first of all, you have to know what you're reacting to, which is called a trigger. And the best way of finding that out is to keep a diary so that you know when you're getting them, if there's any pattern to them. Some women get them around their cycle time, some men get them at the end of a day or every Friday. So there's sometimes a pattern that you can follow with them. And once you can identify that trigger, whether it be chocolates, peanuts, nuts or food colourings, then you've got something to be guided by. So the triggers, is there an actual you know, list of foods that uh, are common triggers. Very much so, Lynn. Uh, peanuts, chocolate, wine, cheese are very common triggers. It doesn't mean they're bad foods. It just means that they can trigger a migraine in some people and not all the time. So what sorts of things would you take for um, if you felt a migraine coming on? If you felt a migraine coming on or you had a particular symptom where it was a right-sided migraine or a left-sided migraine with flashes or paralysis, then specific herbs would be um, prescribed for you in that case. But just as a general, something that is wonderful would be capsicum and even the uh, smell of a capsicum can help ward off a migraine. Also we have our homeopathic medicines like sanguinaria and spagelia and these are also taken every half hour until the pain or the problem subsides. So snoozing, having a nice sleep would uh, relieve a bit of the pain too and, and a lot of people say they don't like light. That's right, they seem to have an aversion to light in a dark room with plenty of cold water would actually help a migraine perhaps not even reach its peak and that way they can get over it before it actually attacks them. Now rosemary oil, what do you do with that? This is a wonderful oil just to dab onto the temple area here and that relaxes the body. It also has a therapeutic effect on the mind, body and spirit which is greatly affected with a migraine. Now massage plays a role too, doesn't it? At the time of having a migraine people really don't want to. They can feel a migraine coming on then they can have massage before it or after the migraine goes preventatively keeping that uh, shoulder neck area very relaxed. Jaw alignment also plays a role too Lynn. People who grind their jaws often are migraine sufferers. And a cold pack works? A cold pack certainly does work Lynn and our cold packs are just applied to the shoulder or to the back of the neck and uh, could be left there for many hours until the pain subsides. They just help ease some of this pressure. So no cure, but prevention? Prevention's better than cure, they say, Lynn. And if we know what we're looking at and understand our triggers, then migraines can be minimised, if not totally depleted out of your life. That would be terrific. And if you'd like to know anything more about the prevention or relief of migraines, just contact your local doctor or naturopath. If you want further information from tonight's show, why not ring us on our information line which is 0055 31600. It's 0055 31600. Or you can write the name of the segment you're interested in on the back of an envelope and send it to us at Healthy, Wealthy and Wise, Post Office Box 180, Nunna Wadding 3131. And don't you forget to enclose a business size stamped addressed envelope. Next week on Healthy, Wealthy and Wise, we visit Bungaree, a historical South Australian sheep station which boasted its own town. We look at a new power company which harnesses nature's own energy and we meet Barry Brickle, a very eccentric New Zealand potter. And if you're in Brisbane, don't forget to visit this wonderful Gondwana rainforest sanctuary. Have a great week, everyone. See you next week. Movie action next on 10 with Midnight Run. On Tuesday and Wednesday nights, investigate the distinctively different detective styles of the classy Jessica Fletcher and the scruffy Columbo. On Tuesday at 8.30, Angela Lansbury's Jessica Fletcher gets mixed up with murder in a Mexican museum in Murder, She Wrote. While on Wednesday, Lieutenant Columbo's holiday cruise gets ruined by a murder aboard ship. 
Quantum Leap's Dean Stockwell co-stars with Peter Falk in our murder and mystery movie at 8.30.